All right, so reviewing 1,3-butadiene. So 1, 2, 3, 4, butadiene, right? Because we have 1, 2, 3, 4 carbons. 1 is where one pi bond starts. 3 is where the other pi bond starts. 1, 3, buta, 4, diene, 2 alkenes. So what is in this system? We have how many electrons are in this p orbital system? How many electrons total? Four electrons. And you got that number because there's how many pi bonds? Two pi bonds. And how many electrons in a bond? Two. Very good. So I went ahead and drew up the way these four p orbitals, right? There's four p orbitals, how they can line up. They can either interact in a constructive fashion or a destructive fashion. They can either share electrons or not share electrons. So in this bottom one, if this axis here is energy, this would be the lowest energy type of bonding interaction, right? The orbitals are all in the same phase, right? They're all in the same phase. So they're all forming pi bonds, right? All of these, if you think of these as waves, they're all interacting positively, constructively. They're all sharing electrons, right? So we have four electrons. I put my first two, right, in the lowest energy orbital. I put my next two in the lowest energy orbital. Now, why is this a little higher in energy? Well, let's look at it. There's a bonding interaction where the p orbitals share electrons. There's an anti-bonding or a non-bonding interaction. There's a node where they can't share electrons. And there's another bonding interaction where they share electrons. So overall, it has a bo two bonding and one non-bond, one anti-bonding. So overall, it's a bonding interaction. So I put electrons in there, and that's still pot, that's still a good thing, right? Putting electrons in something where it's overall bonding, that's a good thing. That's stabilizing. Now, once I go up one more energy level, but we can see why this is higher in energy, because it doesn't have as many bonding interactions as this. But now if we go up one more level, now all of a sudden we have a, a node, a bonding interaction, and then another node. So can't share electrons, can share electrons, can't share electrons. All of a sudden, now we have two nodes and one bonding interaction. Overall, now this is a, an anti-bonding interaction. So a lot of times we'll draw kind of this demarcation line between right, bonding molecular orbitals versus anti-bonding molecular orbitals. All right. And then as you go up another level, right, you can see you can start changing the phases where now there's no bonding interactions at all, and it's both node, node, and node, right? So no electrons are being shared in that orbital, and that's the highest energy orbital, right? So none of those waves are interacting constructively. <coughs> so the way we think about this, right, what we really care about is these electrons and empty orbitals kind of at the, in the middle, right? We want to find the highest energy electrons. We call that the, the HOMO the highest occupied molecular orbital. Molecular orbital. And that's interesting because those usually are the nucleophiles, right? The electron rich, that's, those are the electrons that do the reactions, right? Those are electron rich. When you've done all those pi bonds acting as nucleophiles, we were talking about these electrons in this molecular orbital. Right? But if we want to think about a pi bond as an electrophile, then we look at its LUMO, right? Its lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. That's an electrophile. Right? So every bond, right, at some level, right, can be a nucleophile, nucleophile or electrophile depending on which molecular orbital you're using. All right? So if you want to break a pi bond, what do you do? You put electrons in its LUMO. If you want to use a pi bond as a nucleophile, what do you do? You use its HOMO electrons, its highest occupied molecular orbital electrons. And that's the big difference in energy. All right? This is more complicated than we've seen sigma star, maybe an easier one that we've done, or a less complicated one, could be 
a sigma bond. So in a sigma bond, you have a sigma bond and you have a sigma star. Right? In a sigma bond, how many electrons are there? Two. So you have two electrons in the system, so it's one, one sigma bond, and there's two electrons. So we fill the electrons in here, because this again would be energy. So there's our demarcation line between bonding and antibonding. The sigma bond, right, if I do this in red, most of the electron density in the sigma bond is around the bromine, right? Because it's more electronegative. Where's sigma star going to be at? It's going to be more around the less electronegative carbon. That's where sigma star is at. And that's what sigma star looks like. It's just opposite to that. Right? So we've seen this before, right? If I want to break this sigma bond, I put electrons into sigma star. And that would break this sigma bond. And then the final example I showed in class was what if you have a carbon-oxygen pi bond? Let me draw it like this. How do we think about like a ketone, the carbon-oxygen pi bond? So again, what we think about this, we say, okay, how many electrons are in that pi bond? Two electrons and it's one pi bond, but it becomes a little more complicated now because before, butadiene is all carbons, right? So there's no electronegativity difference, so these are all the same size. But it's more related to this carbon bromine now because now there's an electronegativity difference. So we need to think about, if we draw the pi bond, and there's still pi star, right? So there's gonna be our demarcation line this will still be energy, right? The antibonding orbital is always higher in energy than the bonding orbital. We put two electrons in the pi bond, right? Because there's two electrons, that's where they'll go. Lowest energy first. But now, what does the pi bond look like? That's going to be a little different here. In the pi bond, in the bond, who owns the electrons? Carbon or oxygen? Oxygen does. So let's make oxygen have a larger orbital, right? Showing that the, basically that's saying the electrons are more by the oxygen. That's all it's saying, right? Similarly, how we did the sigma bond here, notice how it kind of leans towards the bromine, not towards the carbon. So the carbon orbital here should be, whoop, should be a little smaller. Still a bonding reaction, but it's smaller there because the carbon doesn't own the electrons in the bond. But now in the antibonding sense, where are the electrons more likely not to be at? They're more likely to not be at the carbon. So now that gets the bigger picture, the bigger lobe, and the oxygen gets the smaller one. And we gotta be careful, right, to show that it's a, there's a node there. because it's it's, The electrons can't be shared. But the size of the orbitals also starts to come into play. And this makes sense, right? Because when you're gonna react a, with a carbonyl, where does the nucleophile go? If I have a, if I have a nucleophile, if I have a Grignard, if I have a MgBr, right? Where do the electrons go? They go to the carbon. That makes sense, right? Because that's where it's most delta plus. That's where the bigger antibonding orbitals at. 